Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and in this episode, we're going to be having a look at the tail shaft for the Al Ferrari. Okay, guys, welcome back. And uh, for those of you who missed it last week, I put in the fuel system for the Al Ferrari. If you want to catch up, I'll put a link up above and uh, you can uh, get caught up there. And um, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please uh, think about uh, subscribing and clicking the bell. It does definitely help us out here. Um, moving forward, uh, there were a couple of questions about the fuel system. Um, there were a few people who didn't understand how the deadhead system works. Um, the Ferrari originally had a deadhead fuel system, so um, what that means is um, uh, a lot of cars with fuel injection originally had the fuel going all the way from the tank through the fuel pump into the end of the fuel rail. It goes through the fuel rail into the injectors there and any fuel that's not used goes out the other end of the fuel rail and returns back to the, uh, to the tank of the car. In a deadhead fuel system, basically it comes out of the tank through your um, filters, pump and pressure regulator. The fuel line is all pressurized to that uh, pressure all the way through the fuel rail and there is no return from the fuel rail. The fuel return is actually from the regulator itself. And in my case, I've got the regulator here. Um, the Ferrari had that as standard. There's actually a couple of bleed nipples on the uh, Ferrari fuel rail to uh, get any air out. But I imagine as soon as it gets under pressure, once it opens uh, a few times, even if it's opening dry, it'll let the air out and it'll fill up with uh, fuel anyway. And uh, the car will burst to life and it's not gonna be an issue. So I don't see it being a problem. Uh, and, and anyway, yeah, the, that's how the car ran from factory and that's how a lot of factory cars run these days. Um, the other question I had about this system was, there was concern that the fuel system is right at the back of the car uh, near the hot exhaust. And yes, if there was a rear collision, that could become an issue, but not a lot more really than what the car had from factory. Factory, the fuel tank was under the car right here right next to the uh, the exhaust pipe that uh, came through. So it's not that much different from standard, just got to plan on not getting hit in the back of the car. So, All right, so I thought I'd just quickly go over some of the little uh, things that I discovered when we were planning to build the custom tail shaft for this car. So uh, here I have, this is the factory alpha tail shaft that was uh, originally in this car. Uh, and this is a factory Subaru BRZ tail shaft. Uh, manual version that um, suits the gearbox. Now, obviously, you need some combination of the two because the, uh, you need to have a gearbox end that fits into the car, and you also need to have the uh, diff end, seeing as we are still using the Alpha factory rear differential, uh, we need to be able to bolt up to that. So we need to have a combination of the two, but we also needed to look at the length of the thing because obviously it's a different length in this car, so everything had to change. Now. Some of the uh, things that need to be considered is the Alpha is a, um, is a live axle car, has a, uh, a solid rear end, uh, whereas the BRZ is an independent rear suspension car. So why that makes a difference is basically because uh, the Alpha diff goes up and down with the suspension, whereas the BRZ, the, the diff is bolted to the car, it's fixed. Uh, it doesn't really move, uh, and it's just the, um, the suspension goes up and down independently on either side. So um, there are different considerations for that. Obviously, because um, the Alpha originally was bolted to the engine, it has a center bearing that bolted to the, to the car, and then this end is, has got a slip joint in it here, so it can go in and out depending on where the, uh, the travel of the diff is, because obviously it needs that flexibility in movement. Whereas the BRZ doesn't have any slip joint after the, um, uh, the center bearing because it doesn't need it. It's a solid fixed spot. It, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a very little bit amount of, there's a little amount of movement on the rubber mountings. There's a little bit of movement on the rubber mountings on the diff, but basically it's fixed. So it doesn't need to change, but there is a bit of slip by the way that it goes into the tail, into the gearbox, just so you can really get it in and out. Cause obviously the gearbox doesn't really move much either. So, I originally tracked down and bought this manual tail shaft thinking we were going to cut them up and use bits of both. But uh, in the end, um, the, uh, the guys built me this fantastic thing. So it is much shorter than the other one. And um, it's taking a lot of those things into consideration. So you can see here, it's got the, the BRZ mount 
uh, that goes into the gearbox in the end. So there is some travel in that, um, but that this section is not really going to move. It's more for just fitting it into the car. The centre bearing, and then um, instead of having a slip joint, what we've actually got is, is um, this is actually CV. So um, a CV joint, it only has probably about uh, looks like about 30 mil of movement, but the actual in actual fact the uh, the amount of uh, travel in and out, even when the diff's going up and down, is actually not that great. You're not talking about a huge range of movement. So um, this is what the, uh, the guys recommended. It's uh, uh, perfect for this situation. It's also potentially gonna help with the CV joint. You can take out some of the, um, the, the vibration that can potentially happen, um, particularly because I'm doing a custom engine mount in the car. When I first put it in, I did mention that um, the diff in the Alpha is factory offset slightly, and uh, the Ferrari engine is obviously centered, so there is a very slight angle there. Um, any angle is not uh, good. Basically, you want to make sure you have... Um, you can have them, as long as they're facing the exact same direction, you can have them offset up, down, left, right, as much as you like. That's not a problem. Uh, but once you start changing, changing angles like this, that's not good, and, and we are at about 1.2 degrees or something, I think I worked it out to be. Um, over three degrees, you get really bad chatter, mostly because of how CV joints work. Uh, I covered that before, but basically you have to make sure the CV joints are aligned, because otherwise they'll go out of phase. That's something you can look up separately. I won't go into that again, but in any case, uh, we have the new tail shaft for the car, so let's go and have a look at what we're gonna have to do to fit it. Okay, so uh, I've got my tail shaft in the car and uh, thankfully my measurements were good and the, uh, the length is correct, it's gonna do the job. But one of the things I did change was I changed the location of where this center bearing goes. That's because with this car, if I take this out, it's hard to hold. Um, basically with this uh, gearbox, I had to mount the, the engine and gearbox are mounted higher than they are in the original car. That's because the Ferrari engine is a dry sump engine. So uh, originally it's designed to sit much lower. You can't get it as low um, because it's not designed to go over the top of the uh, uh, subframe in the front of the car. Um, so because of that, uh, if I had the original uh, center bearing back here where it was going to be, the travel would probably make mean that the, uh, the tail shaft would hit the top of this tunnel. I don't want to have to remake all of this tunnel, but uh, now that I've got it back, I've realized that the tunnel does taper in and narrow pretty much exactly where I want to mount this uh, center bearing. So I'm going to have to mark it out and trim out and make space to bolt the tail shaft in so that we've got plenty of clearance so that when we uh, eventually finally button it up in the car, it's all gonna do exactly what it's supposed to do. All right, so like everything else on this car, uh, nothing is that simple. So I, as I said, I can't just bolt in that tail shaft. And of course, it's going to actually interfere where the factory mount for the handbrake goes. So um, uh, basically the tunnel sort of stays wider all the way up to uh, sort of the, the center of the handbrake here, and then it tapers back in and gets narrower back further. All I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, remove that taper from here and just, and just widen it out um, until back past this sort of uh, divot here. So basically it means it's time to start cutting this out and then I'm going to have to uh, work out the handbrake mount separately again and it may mean moving it up higher or something. It all adds to the fun.
All right, so the tail shaft is in. I've bolted it loosely to the diff and the back end. I cut out the tunnel, as you saw, and um, there is a now, you know, I can now sort of put the tail shaft roughly into place. Now, I did cut off the, um, the original mounts for the center bearing, which I'm gonna reuse because why not? Um, but I obviously need to rebuild the tunnel and work out the exact place so that I've got the right amount of movement in this uh, CV for the, the diff. So I need to temporarily put it in place first to uh, make sure it's all good. So let's start rejigging, do a little bit more trimming and, uh, and see if I can get a rough placement and, uh, and make, take the, uh, the diff through its full travel to make sure it's going to work. So I've tacked this uh, center bearing in. I've checked to see that I have enough travel up and down with my diff so that the, uh, the CV has enough room to, to move and that all works it nicely. Uh, clearances are all good, but I wanna move it over just a little bit because the, the line is just a little bit out. I wanna move it, it's probably hard to see on camera, but I wanna move it over just a little bit, get this perfectly straight in line with the diff. So as you may have seen in my previous video, I managed to get my guillotine working again. At the moment, it's still holding together, so fingers crossed it stays that way. I've got my basic tunnel cut out now, so uh, it's time to fold it up and then see how we go about getting it to fit into the car. Okay, so I've uh, folded up these edges and these are gonna be the uh, at the bottom of the tunnel. So I'm gonna curve this whole panel like this. Um, I've put a, a little bevel on this edge because I wanna have a, uh, a sort of step down from the tunnel. And you may look at this and go, how on earth are you going to get that curved as a tunnel? And that is where the shrinker comes in. So I'm gonna run through with the shrinker and by shrinking this edge, it will curve this whole panel and uh, I'll have to tweak it a bit by hand, but hopefully we can get just the right shape uh, with the, uh, the shrinker and uh, a bit of back and forth. So let's give it a go. With a bit of sort of bending and shrinking, you can sort of see that I've got this uh, this sort of taper in the end here. It's not perfectly neat at this stage. I can just do a bit more hammer tweaking to get rid of some of these extra bulges and get it sort of just right. But I've got my basic tunnel shape. So let's go and put it in the car, mark it and trim it and see if I can sort of tack it into place. And um, yeah, and I'll have the tunnel the way I need it. Okay, so this is pretty good now. It's, it's not, uh, I mean, it's just sitting in here, um, but uh, the shape is pretty good that I can actually start going around and tacking and uh, tacking and joining it all together and making it all part of this tunnel. I'm happy with the fitment. I'm happy with the clearance of the tail shaft. So let's start making this part of the car.
I've got my tail shaft in. It's all nice and straight. Um, yeah, I'm quite happy with the, uh, the new tunnel. I'm going to tie it all together when I do all of it. When the car's on the rotisserie, it's not worth doing it all now because uh, it's quite difficult welding upside down. So I'm quite happy with that. Uh, I, the tail shaft is going to work. It's not going to hit anything. It's got enough travel for the, uh, the diff to go up and down. And while I'm on the topic of the diff, there has been lots of comments, and I've mentioned it before, but uh, lots of people are going, is this going to be up to the challenge of running the Ferrari engine? And from all accounts, yes, it should be. Uh, this is a, quite a stout diff. It's the factory LSD that was in these two litre cars. Um, it's got really stout axles and lots of guys who've run them in race cars with big power, turbo cars, um, with big torque hits. And um, you need to remember the Ferrari engine is not a super torquey engine. It revs really high, but it, uh, it's not a super torquey engine. So while we're on the topic of the diff, the diff is a 1041, which is a 4.1 to 1 ratio. Um, rear end and that coupled with the brz gearbox coupled with the ferrari engine which has a red line of 8700 rpm it's quite a high revving uh flat plane crank v8 drivability wise the ratios um worked out uh, basically i've got them on my phone um so basically at 3000 rpm in sixth gear on the highway this should be doing uh 65 miles an hour 105 kilometers an hour so uh, that's quite quite nice. It's not uh, it's not excessive. It should be uh, revving nicely. Um, it has a theoretical top speed uh, of 304 kilometers an hour, uh, 189 miles an hour. There is no way I'm doing that in this car. Uh, yeah. That, so uh, yeah, it, it's got plenty of legs on it in top gear. Uh, I don't know if it could actually get there with wind resistance and all the rest of it, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, and um, Redline in second gear, so uh, is uh, 66 miles an hour, 106 kilometers an hour. So, so nice usable gear range, which is what you want on a car like this. So I think the, uh, the ratios and everything should be bang on what we need. But um, now we have the tail shaft in. That is actually all the time I have uh, this week. I spent a lot of time this week actually repairing my guillotine. It's working again, as you saw, I used it in this, which is, which is good. Um, but um, uh, that's another job off the list. I am really getting, getting close, uh, getting everything tied up. Still a bit more to go, but uh, we'll tackle that stuff next week. But uh, that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, midway through 1951, Ferrari released its 212 F1, running a 2.6 litre Colombo V12. Only two of these cars were ever built because by 1952, Alfa Romeo and others withdrew from Formula One racing, leaving only Ferrari. So the FIA decided to adopt Formula Two regulations so there'd be more competition. This prompted Ferrari to build the 500. Now the Ferrari 500 was built specifically for Formula 2 regulations with the Lampredi 2 litre inline 4 cylinder engine making 165 horsepower. The engine was mounted behind the front axle giving the car front mid mount layout for better handling. Alberto Ascari piloted the car to his first world championship that year winning all but one race as he missed a race to race in the Indianapolis 500. The following year, Ascari won every race except for the last one, which was won by Juan Manuel Fangio, who was back to racing after a neck injury. Ascari won seven consecutive World Championship races, a record which stood until 2013 when it was broken by Sebastian Vettel. All right, uh, another job ticked off the list. We have a, uh, the engine finally mounted up to the wheels, so uh, the power is going to get all the way through. Uh, the tunnel is in there. I mean, I still have to finish buttoning that, all that up. Uh, I've still got to mount the handbrake somewhere because I've cut that mount out, so that's something else to have a look at, particularly when I start tackling more of the interior stuff. Uh, we are definitely getting it. Um, slowly but surely, every week, chipping away at it. Chipping away. <laughs> yep. Yep, getting there. All anyway, right. well, it's freezing cold in the garage today, so yeah, it's wet, and wet drizzly outside. rainy, yeah, eight degrees, yeah, Celsius. So, um, yeah. yeah, if you want to 
Portis and uh, keep me out in this freezing garage doing more of these uh, videos. So Jeff can buy some thermal underwear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, please uh, join us on Patreon uh, to watch the videos a day early ad free. Um, like and subscribe if you haven't and uh, let Jeff know what you think because he likes reading the comments. Yep, and we'll see you in the next one. See you guys. Okay. 2951 Ferrari. Lampredi two line, four litre. No, a Lampredi two line, four engine. No, a Lampredi two cylinder, in line, four engine. No, a Lampredi two. How did you get that to go? Yeah. <laughs> because I kind of had the pre practice. Normally they don't get any pre practice. <laughs> Mid mount handling for better access. No. Front mid mount layout for better access. <laughs> better handling. Handling. <laughs>